Good afternoon, everyone. What a wonderful inauguration session. We've had uh, luminaries, absolutely, field of medicine, and tradition, Kahoon, NABL, with a, with a marvelous lecture of, from Dr. Priya. Thank you, Kao, for uh, really uh, getting her here and um, with these pearls of wisdom that she's shown on all of us. I continue on um, to uh, the next scientific session, and it's my privilege to welcome the next two chairpersons, Dr. Raja Lakshmi Tirumalai, a professor of pathology at St. John's Medical College and uh, probably an icon in general pathology in this country. She's the editor-in-chief of Indian Journal of Dermat, past vice president and secretary of the Dermat, the Dermatopath Society of India. She has uh, trained widely and numerous times in Germany, and she's had a huge number of papers and awards that she's had. Thank you uh, for uh, gracing the occasion, Dr. Raja Lakshmi. And I also uh, welcome Dr. Preeti Bajaj, Dr. Preeti is with us on CAO and is the professor and head of the Department of Pathology at the Vasanta Rao Power College, Nasik. Dr. Preeti has many publications to her credit, and she's been a faculty and organizing chairperson. I hand over the mic to post lunch scientific session. Thank you. Wishes to everyone from Nasik. I, Dr. Preeti Bajaj, take great pride in introducing Dr. Jag Bhavan, our next keynote speaker. He is Guido Maino, Professor of Dermatology and Pathology, Head Dermatopathology Section and Vice Chair Dermatology, Boston University School of Medicine, United States. Dr. Bhavan is also the Director of Dermatopathology Fellowship, International Dermatopathology Training Program and Teledermatology Service. He received his undergraduate degree from Molana Azad Medical College in 1968 and a doctorate degree in pathology in 1972 from the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. He then went on to be trained in pathology and dermatopathology at St. Vincent Hospital in Worcester, Massachusetts. He also trained in dermatology at the combined Boston University Tufts Dermatology Program before joining as faculty at Boston University in 1986. He's board certified in pathology, dermatology, and dermatopathology. That tells all about him. He's a fellow of many reputed international societies. He has published over 250 original articles written several book chapters and co-authored an interactive dermatopathology atlas on CD-ROM. This really seems quite interesting, sir. Recently, an online and iBook version of atlas has been made available. His research interests include melanocytic lesions, cutaneous aging, and pigmentary disorders. He also serves on the editorial board of the American Journal of Dermatopathology, Dr. Bhavan's passion for teaching can be seen in the fact that he has been awarded many awards, including Best Teacher of the Year Award from the Dermatology Residence of the Combined Boston Turks University's Dermatology Program and also by the residents and international trainees in dermatology at Boston University. Also a recipient of Walter Nickel Award, sir, it is indeed an honor for all of us to hear from you today on role of clinical pathology correlations in management of skin disorders. Um, thank you, Dr. Bajaj, for that kind introduction, as well as Dr. Bhargava for kind invitation to this conference. It's my pleasure to be sharing with me, uh, with you, my thoughts regarding clinical pathology correlation. I understand that this audience is not made up of pathologists and dermatologists, but a wide range of uh, clinical disciplines, including radiologists, lab people, and so on. I believe that my talk, even though it is not directly relevant to your field, will stimulate you to think about 
the idea of clinical pathology correlation. Of course, I will share you examples in dermatology, but the basic principle will remain the same in no matter what field you are. So with that, I will like to present a series of cases um, uh, based on my personal observation over the last four and a half decades. This is the story of a 78 year old man who presents with vesiclobullus eruption. And most of you at, in this age group will think the, about the diagnosis of bullus pamphigoid. And in, thick, in fact, when the biopsy was performed, it shows the, what is known as eosinophilic spongiosis. That means the presence of eosinophils within the epidermis, as you can see in this high power photomicrograph. And the immunofluorescence also showed the deposition of immunoglobulin G and complement C3 at the dermoepidermal junction. These are pretty diagnostic features of bullous pamphigoid. Now it turns out that this patient really did not have bullous pamphigoid. And what happened was that this patient has scabies. When I called to discuss the results of this patient with the clinician who had performed the biopsy, he did not inform me that patient has these lesions which are extremely pruritic, extremely itchy, and they were also in the web spaces, which is quite characteristic of scabies. So it turns out that this patient has actually scabies, and without getting treatment for bullous pamphigoid, his lesions all resolved within a week after giving him antiscabatic treatment, and thus he was spared from a horrendous steroid. Uh, therapy which he would have been given had the diagnosis of bolus pamphigoid made. So this case illustrates the importance of clinical pathology correlation and also underscores that not one positive test or one test should be uh, considered as the diagnostic of a one particular disease because it may be uh, that it has some other features. And so always a test should be taken in the, in the light of clinical and other uh, data. This is an interesting case where one sees acantholysis. And uh, those of you who don't know, acantholysis occurs within the epidermis and is quite correct, characteristic diagnostic feature of pemphigus. And this is my, in my very early days in 1975 or 76, I was attending a meeting such as this educational event where we were given slides and to make a diagnosis. And I made the diagnosis of pemphigus, feeling that I will be definitely correct. However, when the moderator came out to discuss all the cases, we were embarrassed to find out that this is not a pemphigus, but this is truly still an acantholysis, but caused by the presence, by the, uh, by the uh, application of heat. This is not the photo from this patient, but this patient had, was applying heating pad and had developed a rash, which a biopsy was taken. And so this is a heat induced acantholysis, which is mimicking pemphigus vulgaris. The difference here is, if you note very um, uh, closely, that the acantholytic cells in, uh, in heat induced acantholysis are elongated, which is a hallmark of heat induced changes, thermal changes, whereas in pemphigus vulgaris, the cells become rounded. And so there are some clues to which one can make a distinct distinction. But usually when we're looking at a case and not knowing the clinical history, we can succumb to a misdiagnosis. So this was a very interesting case. This is another case where one sees acantholysis. And in this case, the acantholysis is pretty extensive. And so again, one would think about making a diagnosis of pemphigus. However, I will tell you, higher power of acantholysis. And this patient, the clinical diagnosis is quite dramatic and quite characteristic of a condition known as pityriasis rubra pilaris. So don't worry about the names and don't worry about any of the diagnosis. But the important thing that I want to impress upon you that in this condition, which has nothing to do with acantholytic or a blistering eruption, the biopsy findings may show changes similar to pemphigus. And this is a, especially in the early stages of the disease. And we don't know why it happens, but it happens. So this is not pemphigus, 
and does not the patient doesn't have to be treated for pemphigus. So once again, the idea being that you want to make sure that there is a good clinical pathology correlation in making a definitive diagnosis. Okay, so this composite micro photomicrograph shows the presence of a neutrophilic pustule within the epidermis. And just in high power showing you the presence of many neutrophils in the epidermis. This process, we call it is the neutrophilic uh, pustule or, or pustulosis and can be seen in variety of conditions. In this case, this condition is acute generalized exanthematous pustulosis. Same finding you can see in pustular psoriasis. The same findings you can see in candidiasis. And the same findings you can see in impetigo herpetiformis, which is a condition seen in pregnant women and resembles to pustular psoriasis. So I've just shown you a series of photographs which is identical, but in four different conditions. So once again, clinical pathology co uh, correlation is extremely important. Here is an example of what we call it eosinophilic pustulosis, in which there is a presence of eosinophils within the epidermis. And once again, this condition can be seen in many situations, as in this case, creeping eruption. This is a, caused by a larva. Uh, when people are walking on the beach and sometimes you get infection and you get this kind of a histopathologic photo, a uh, picture. And then same findings can be seen in a uh, genetically induced condition known as incontinentia pigmentee, in which you can get, get this vesiculobullous eruption and once again shows similar histopathologic findings. And in this condition, the uh, a newborn uh, children, they can have a rash which usually goes away in a few days, it spontaneously resolves, uh, resolves. And in this case, again, the findings are similar. So once again, eosinophilic spongiosis can be seen in variety of conditions. And unless you know the clinical findings, you will make a misdiagnosis. This is a very, very interesting case and a challenging case that I saw personally in my clinic. Uh, this, if those of you, if anybody is in the pathologist in the audience, will make a very quick diagnosis of mycosis fungoides. It is so classical, beautiful pottery abscesses, atypical lymphocytes, and absolutely there is no, nothing else that can be. You know, I think this is one of the things that we can make a definitive diagnosis. However, what bothered me as a clinician now, because I was wearing both hats, when I, I saw the patient originally, and when I saw the biopsy, I said, this not, does not make any sense. I will show you the clinical photographs. It was even PCR positive for uh, T cell re gene rearrangement. Now, what happened in this case, she has a hypopigmented lesions on the entire groin, including the perivulvar region and the perianal region. These are not the findings that one sees in a case of mycosis fungoides. This is just not happening. We, I share these photographs uh, with my uh, co colleague and a clinical oncologist, and she said, no, this cannot be mycosis fungoides. So, what what's the reason for this kind of a reaction? Why she has a mycosis fungoides like picture? As the patient was leaving the door of the clinic, I asked her, what do you, are you using any kind of wipes to clean yourself? And she says, yes, I use baby wipes. So it turns out that this patient has what is called as lymphomatoid contact dermatitis. Lymphomatoid contact dermatitis is resembling mycosis fungoides. So my friends, make sure that you have the proper clinical history. If you do not, if I did not ascertain the history from this patient, I would have treated this patient for mycosis fungoides and that would have been a disaster. So we know that similar cases have been now reported uh, of lymphomatoid contact dermatitis due to baby wipes. And I tell my, uh, my patients in US, because in India, it is, most people are still using uh, water to wash. Um, but in, in US, people are using lots of baby wipes and, and tissue paper and so on. And I tell them to invest some money and use the butt wash, which will help <laughs> prevent this kind of a condition. Also, um, lymphomatoid contact dermatitis can be caused by exotic wood in a, in, a, in a toilet seat. So just again, just to underscore that there are simulators of contact dermatitis. Which, uh, which can cause 
histopathologic features which resemble mycosis fungoides. In this uh, microphotograph, again, you see the features, what looks like atypical lymphocytes within the epidermis. And once again, we have to think of, of mycosis fungoides. But clinically, this patient has vitiligo. Some cases of vitiligo can have very inflammatory lesions and may resemble mycosis fungoides. So it is important, once again, to note the clinical features. This is a case I want to share because this is my granddaughter. And my granddaughter had a hypopigmented patch. And as you know, clinically, hypopigmented patch in young children is considered to be possibility of hypopigmented mycosis fungoides. I even showed her to my clinical colleague who is a, a oncologist, and she also thought of, of CT cell or mycosis fungoides hypopigmented. But when we did the biopsy, it shows atypical lymphocytes. However, I was not convinced of the diagnosis of CTCL. And I felt that, this, that she has probably dry skin and we should use her, uh, give her tropical steroids. And within a week, all her lesions disappeared. This is her clinical photograph showing you hypopigmented patch, which res resembles the hypopigmented variant of CTCL. And you can see on the right-hand side, atypical lymphocytes in forming groups and microabscesses, quite typical for mycosis fungoides. So once again, CPC, remember CPC. These are all, again, cases of CTCL, which resemble CTCL, but these are not CTCL. This is a patient of lichen striatus who has uh, usually seen in younger children and usually in the lower legs. Uh, these, these lesions resolve spontaneously, but histologically, they can mimic CTCL. Another case of... Um, uh, a, a, a CT cell looking like lesion, but this is lichen sclerosis. This is also common, but some cases may show atypical lymphocyte within the basal layer of the epidermis, quite typical for CTCL. And pigmented purpuric eruption can be seen to show uh, features of mycosis fungoides. And you can, in this case, you can see these atypical lymphocytes lining up the epidermis and sometimes forming in group as microabscesses. But the close examination uh, shows extravasated red cells. And once you see the clinical four findings, it is quite typical to be of pigmented purpuric eruption uh, uh, resembling, resembling uh, mycosis fungoides. Okay, you can skip. Uh, this is interesting. And I think, I think you should know this, this uh, kind of thing. This is a granulomatous uh, histopathologic finding. And granulomas are extremely common in India. I'm sure that you are seeing it all the time and you're thinking of tuberculosis, sarcoid, leprosy, and so on. But in this case, believe it or not, this is a patient of mycosis fungoides. So sometimes mycosis fungoides can present as granulomatous uh, a finding in histopathology. So CPC is again important. This is a patient who has a phenomenal plaque of uh, a lesion of mycosis fungoides on its trunk but the histology shows a granulometrous reaction. Okay. Uh, this patient is absolutely a nice thing which, uh, which I like to present. This is a young woman who had a biopsy done for a, a, a lesion on her vulva. Now, anybody in the audience will absolutely jump to the diagnosis of a cancer. It's an in-situ lesion because it is not invaded. It is within the epidermis. So any pathologist will call it squamous cell carcinoma in situ. And that's exactly how it was called, squamous cell carcinoma in situ. And I don't blame the pathologist for calling it squamous cell carcinoma in situ. However, what I blame the pathologist, and in this case also the clinician, that they are not paying any attention to the clinical summary. The clinical thing was that this is a 21-year-old young woman. How many young 21 year young women will have cancer carcinoma in situ on their vulva? Plus, she has multiple lesions, and that is also very unusual. You don't get multiple lesions of skin cell carcinoma in situ unless you have xeroderma pigmentosum or some other genetic disorder. This patient was completely healthy. This is a bilateral vulvectomy specimen. To me, this is malpractice because you cannot do, because this is a benign condition. This condition is known as bovinoid papillosis. This is a HPV-induced con condition which histopathologically resembles squamous cell carcinoma in situ. So you see how important it is to make that clinical pathology correlation. This is a case of Bowen's disease, which is usually seen in sun-protected areas, erythematous plaque, 
And this shows also histopathologic changes of skin cell carcinoma in situ. In past, these were associated with visceral malignancy, which is not seen anymore uh, because we don't use arsenic uh, in, in our arsenal. And uh, actinic keratosis, which is a very common condition in, uh, in uh, white individuals in the US, uh, every third patient we see is, uh, has actinic keratosis, uh, also shows features of skin cell carcinoma in situ. So there are many, uh, this is arsenical keratosis, which also shows skin cell carcinoma in situ. And this is erythropoiesia of kerat, which is skin cell carcinoma in situ of the glass penis. So skin cell carcinoma in situ is a histopathologic diagnosis, but please make sure you're looking at the clinical so you can make the right diagnosis and not have a patient subject to bovinoid fibrosis as it happened in our case. A very interesting case, a, a shear biopsy of this lesion was performed. And when I saw this, I said, this is quite classical of a Veruca vulgaris, right? However, our clinician friend did not give me this photograph. He did not tell me this was this lesion, ulcerating large pericard lesion. And he gave me a shear biopsy, as you saw. And you can see in this uh, photomicrograph, if I draw the line between the two ends, the top superficial portions look like Veruca vulgaris. So extremely important, what you're getting is a sample, whether it's a sample in histopathology, whether it's a sample, a blood sample or in radiology, if you don't have the entire picture, you will have a problem. So this case is skin cell carcinoma, varicose skin cell carcinoma of the foot. So CPC is extremely important. This is a, a what we call is a palisading granuloma with fibrinoid necrosis. Pathologists dream because the pathologists make a very classical diagnosis of rheumatoid nodule. And there's nothing really not to make a diagnosis of rheumatoid nodule, except clinically there was no indication. Even then we made a diagnosis of rheumatoid nodule. And my trainees wanted to have a, a, a section for their own collection. So we did multiple sections and we found a wood splinter uh, within this lesion when we were doing multiple cuts. So it, it turns out that this is a splinter which has caused this foreign body reaction, which resembles rheumatoid nodule. So once again, CPC. This is a case of rheumatoid nodule. Look at the pictures, it's identical. And in this case, another necrotizing granuloma, palisading with fibrinoid necrosis in the middle and palisading of histiocytes. Once again, looks like a rheumatoid nodule. But in this case, the patient has fever, night sweats, fatigue, lethargy, loss of appetite, saddle nose deformity, lung findings, and all of you will make a diagnosis of Wegener's granulomatosis. So once again, histopathology is important, but the clinical is as important and correlation is even more important, Wegener's granulomatosis. Lastly, uh, this is the 35-year-old man with lesion of the finger, which has a nodule, and this nodule has many, many giant cells. And this case we got as a consultation because they thought of a giant cell tumor. But something was bothering me when I saw this slide because this pigment was not classical for hemosiderin, which is the feature of this tumor. And we thought about some um, pigment as melanin and we did frontonomasin stain, which was also negative. And so I pushed for additional findings. And it turns out that the patient had a paint gun injury in this site in earlier. So I had to dig out this information and it turns out that this is a paint gun injury which has caused the granulometrics reaction on his finger. So once again, CPC is extremely important. Sure. All right, so here is another uh, example of a, a granulometrics reaction which has frequent number uh, with, uh, with many eosin fields scattered throughout the stroma. And this is quite classical photograph for a juvenile xanthogranoma. However, in this case, this patient has this clinical findings, erythematous plaques, some nodular lesions, some ulcerative lesions, this patient has paraproteinemia. So when you have these kind of photograph lesions, this is not a juvenile xanthogranoma, but this is a xanthogranoma, a necrobiotic xanthogranoma, which is associated with paraproteinemia. It's a very serious condition but the histopathological changes can be mimicking. All right. 
And I would want to really uh, impress upon this case because I will suspect that you will see this, these kind of cases in India. This is a case where you see at the dermoepidermal junction nests of melanocytes with a inflammatory response. And these atypical nests of melanocytes are confluent, they are decisive. These are hallmarks of findings what we see in melanoma in situ. And so in US, we will make this diagnosis of melanoma in situ in, in very short time. And uh, except in this case, and, and we prove this, that these are melanocytic nests by doing special stains as melanin and, and SOX10, just proving that this is a truly melanocytic nest. But what happened was, this is the story of a 48-year-old Pakistani man who has several month history of two by three centimeter, well-circumscribed, voluscious, hyperpigmented, non-blanching polyneural patch on the neck. And it was on both sides. This is not the photograph. This is not the clinical feature of a melanoma. So this is a dermatitis, and this is a lichenoid dermatitis. And for what reason, we don't know. But in lichenoid dermatitis, you can see melanocytic proliferation, which can resemble melanoma in situ. And I suspect that you will see these patients quite a lot in this country. So please pay attention. If you're seeing anything but what things like a melanoma in situ, think about the clinical findings because melanoma in situ is not common in this country. And so if you are making a diagnosis of that, make sure you have the entire clinical photograph. Okay. And lastly, this is a, a woman who presented with erythematous patch on, his, on her breast and actually on both breasts, one more the other and a kind of a, 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 a clinical photograph that was thought to be either lupus or morphia. We were all very puzzled and biopsy showed interface dermatitis, which also is a feature of, of, uh, supportive of a, a connective tissue disorder. But the story of this patient was that she was using a cell phone and talked to her daughters for hours while doing chores. And she had her mobile phone sometimes on one side of the bra and sometimes on the other side of the bra, which caused this kind of a reaction. So once again, CPC. Um, I think I'm going to skip this case. Um, just to let you know that, again, this is a granulometrous reaction, and I'm sure you're seeing granulometrous reaction all the time, that sometimes the organisms may not be seen very easily. And this is a case of leishmania, which doesn't have much organism. So it's a posicellular leishmaniasis, which we had to prove it by doing PCR. This is a patient who had presented to our dermatology clinic with this very umbilical and peri uh, labial erythematous macules and uh, angiomatous lesions. But the patient actually came to us because she, he has pruritus, generalized pruritus and dry skin. And the renal uh, the team had sent us because they had no idea why the patient has renal failure. But they said, well, the patient's bothered about, her, uh, uh, about his age. So when we saw this patient, my, my colleague, my clinical colleague, uh, thought of the patient, that patient may have Fabry's disease, because this is one of the reasons why patient have, people can have renal failure. And yes, we suspected that diagnosis clinically. We uh, processed the, uh, the, the tissue for electron microscopy and proved that this patient has Fabry's disease by the presence of these um, electron dense bodies on electron microscopy. So this patient has Fabry's disease. So now, because of the fact that you use clinical pathology correlation, you are able to actually save or, and make a right diagnosis for the patient and guide the, your, your clinical colleagues to come to the right diagnosis. And uh, with that, I will end, and I, will, I want to ask anybody who wants to tell me what this is. I will tell you, my colleagues all across the world, not in India, they give me one answer. You suspect what that answer is? Taj Mahal. The Taj Mahal is never colored, right? So the reason I'm showing you is a CPC. This is a flag of Denmark. Uh, and this place is a Moroccan restaurant in a Tivoli Garden in Denmark, which resembles Taj Mahal. So we need CPC to come to the right diagnosis. This is Taj Mahal. This is Eiffel Tower in Paris and Eiffel Tower in China. So once again, you need CPC. Thank you very much.
so thank you sir for that uh, extremely illustrative uh, talk uh, for me it was uh, literally like uh, walking on the beach and uh, picking up shells only difference is that each shell that you showed us is like it's the lesson of a lifetime and uh, being in dermatopathology i absolutely understand uh, the necessity for clinical pathologic correlation that you've so rightly illustrated in fact uh, a lot of people particularly residents uh, they ask me you know um, ma'am is it important to know clinical dermatology in order to be a good uh, dermatopathologist and uh, the answer that i always give them is like clinical dermatology is gross pathology to a dermatopathologist so it's the same importance that we would give to uh, gross pathology in other organs is uh, you know, what we need to give here Uh, I have a couple of uh, questions, sir, for you, sir. Uh, sure. Very often, what uh, we find is that uh, we have missing information on the request forms that we get. So uh, things are incomplete, and even at the end of doing special stains and all that, uh, we are really not able to go beyond giving a patter. So, in such instances, what would be your words of advice in order to make a meaningful report? yeah it's a it's a very good question and uh, you are not alone we have the same issue <laughs> if, if you as uh, many of our forms will say lesion or rash and no information sometimes we don't even know the site and so my suggestion to you is that if the diagnosis is quite apparent um let's say even in the case of squamous cell carcinoma in situ and if i see that lesion is, is on the genitalia i always add a line that these findings are based on the histopathology alone and you must use cpc um, to make a definitive diagnosis and such lesions can be seen in pulmonary papillosis and so on so we will always uh, put a disclaimer the same thing for example for uh, the the cases i showed you of uh, which mimic ctcl we would add that that cpc is essential and we do make an effort to call them but obviously it's not practical if you are running a busy lab to call for every single case uh, to have clinical findings but at least by putting in your in, a, in the report a line that cpc is extremely important that you are putting a disclaimer so that way at least from a medical legal stand of point of view they will not go after you yes yeah so somebody is writing that uh, that would delay the final diagnosis of the patient so uh, my response is this would you rather have a good diagnosis or or a easy fast diagnosis and the example of the uh, rheumatoid nodule that i showed you uh, in us we have a tremendous pressure in giving diagnosis within 24 hours because these are commercial labs and they are fighting for uh, for getting specimens and and so that is how they do it they say okay we'll give you diagnosis in 12 hours so my response to these people is always don't do this is better to take your time nobody is going to die even of ctcl even of melanoma so what will happen if the diagnosis is delayed by even a week is nothing will happen chill out it's no need no need to get hyper okay yeah i think that's a very important uh, point that you made particularly with uh, regard to missing a diagnosis of ms i think uh, there is a lot of uh, anxiety both on the uh, part of the dermatologist as well as the uh, patient so i think uh, that is uh, what sir said is very right that probably you give out a pattern based description and then you review the case once you have more clinical information and follow up and then sign out uh, the final diagnosis which would actually be the prudent uh, thing to do i just have one more question sir this is a difficulty that i face per personally especially with uh, regard to sarcoidosis so the question is for sarcoidosis clinically it uh, fits in but histologically it's not really a sarcoidal pattern of a granular matter's inflammation so in such instances how should the report be worded uh, so once again uh, you know we you probably see a lot more cases of sarcoid than we do um, and um, so our role uh, our goal is always you know as you know sarcoidosis is a disease of ex exclusion um, when you exclude infectious process so in I'm, i suspect in india you will make want to make sure it's not tuberculosis and it's not leprosy that is the number one priority and in our case we also try to uh, exclude uh, leishmaniasis which is we are seeing several cases of leishmaniasis now in our places uh, because people are uh, migrating or coming traveling from other countries 
Um, so we, we always, the other thing is that if there are lung findings in these patients, right, then it becomes easier, uh, especially if they have lung findings uh, to call it a consistent sarcoidosis. But once again, we always say um, that a biopsy for culture, and, uh, despite the fact that histopathology, um, your special stains are negative, but sometimes a culture or a PCR may be required to come to the diagnosis for a, to rule out infectious disease. So I think once you rule out infectious disease and there are features which are suggesting sarcoidosis, uh, either clinically, either in dermatology findings or in lung findings, then you have a better ground for calling it sarcoidosis. Thank you. That was uh, very helpful. Uh, so I think that was a wonderful uh, session. And every time I listen to Sir, I take back a lot of practical points. In fact, today, just today, I have a patient who's young and whose biopsy is looking like Bowens. So I'm going to think twice before signing that out. Uh, so thank you very much. And thanks to Dr. Seema for giving me this opportunity. And also my co-chairperson, Dr. Preeti, for uh, hosting this session with me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You really covered so much in such little time by base of uh, micro photographs and case based presentation. It was really an enlightening lecture by you. Thank you. Thank you, chairpersons, for that, for sharing such a wonderful session. I remember 25 years ago, Dr. Gawan and Dr. Asha Kuba uh, did a training workshop, of course, he's done many of them now in, uh, down the line. That was my initial foray into dermatopathology. So um, I have a lot to thank him for. You know, my initial learning came from that particular conference. When you gave out CDs, sir, they ran for a couple of years with my CD player broke down. <laughs> so that was, that was fantastic. I remember having that and enjoying my initial forays into dermatopathology. Pattern recognition. I still remember you talking about pattern recognition in that conference. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you.